it's officially seven and we can make a start. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm sure that after long days uh, spending your time in front of a computer screen in conference calls, um, the last thing you want to do is join another one. So we really appreciate you making the time and this sunny evening to join us for this maybe not that uplifting, but nonetheless important um, and urgent uh, debate and uh, discussion with uh, Daniel Seidemann. Um, Danny has been a real friend of Yahad for a long time now, and it's always a pleasure to meet him in Israel, in the UK, or in the World Wide Web. Um, and we're really grateful for having you tonight. Uh, before we'll make a formal start. I'll just do a bit of uh, housekeeping uh, technical stuff. Um, so this would go on for one hour. We'll aim to do this in one hour. Um, I would kick off this discussion with a few questions, but we are keen to try and get as many questions from you, from the participants, as we can. You can see there's a Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. There's already a um, a chat there that someone put. Um, please use this to submit your questions. We'll do our best to um, address as many of them as we can. Um, as with any event, we would ask you to, if you can, please keep your questions brief and in a question form, i.e. having a question mark at the end, not a statement, if, if that's possible. Um, so, Daniel, thank you again for joining us. Daniel, for those of you who don't know, is an Israeli attorney who specializes in Israeli-Palestinian relations in Jerusalem. He is the founder of Terrestrial Jerusalem, which is an NGO that works towards a resolution to the question of Jerusalem that is consistent with the two-state solution. Um, as you may have, some of you may know, Jerusalem is one of the key parts of any negotiations or the key parts of the disagreement in this conflict, and his work is trying to understand how can this part be addressed as part of a two-state solution? Um, beyond the uh, terrestrial Jerusalem, he was also involved in founding uh, Iramim and other NGOs that are working in and on Jerusalem and is also one of the leading experts in the world to all Jerusalem matters. Uh, so Danny, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My pleasure. Um, so, my first question is for people that, and I'm sure many here and even many in Israel, not just British Jews, but Israeli Jews, what they know about East Jerusalem is the Kotel and maybe some other holy sites, but that's about it. Um, could you explain a bit what the reality is in East Jerusalem uh, for the people who live there, for Palestinians and Jews who live there, uh, for those of us who are less familiar with it? Well, first of all, thank you, Maya, and thank you, Yachad. I, I have to tell you that um, these are difficult times for us here in the trenches, and uh, the work of Yachad is sustenance for us, and uh, God bless you and keep up the work, and anything I can do to help you, I'm willing to, because you deserve it, okay? Look, uh, let me begin by telling you about an event that you Last night was Lelet al Qadr, which is at the end of Ramadan. Traditionally, there are 500,000 plus people gathering to worship on Haram al Sharif. Didn't happen this year because of the virus. It was shut down. But when it did happen, my Israeli compatriots here in Jerusalem didn't know it. The most important thing to know about East Jerusalem is that no Israelis know it, period, or very, very, very few. Um, now, I'm going to talk to you a good deal this evening about the occupation of Jerusalem, but that would be a disservice because East Jerusalem is not only occupation. It is a universe unto itself. The old city is a walled medieval city. It is an Arab city. It's an open-air market in the Jewish quarter. It's a shtetl. It's a slum. Um, it's an urban hub. And if you move and that's one square kilometer if you move out of it to the north you'll find the central business district of east jerusalem which looks like amman and then move south to Tzorbacher, which is a village becoming urbanized and if you move to beit Hanina, it will be 
what um, Americans call the Upper West Side of East Jerusalem. We would call Amakrifa Aim in East Jerusalem, and I guess you would call upscale High Street in, in the UK. Um, it's all of these, and it's much more. Um, Having said that, when you go to East Jerusalem, it's clear that you are leaving West Jerusalem and entering into a different world. You're leaving the um, modern upscale world into a world of impoverishment. Um, you're moving into a world where you can feel it in your ass when you drive through Jerusalem. You leave West Jerusalem and enter East Jerusalem. There are potholes. That's not a, a, um, a coincidental. That is an expression of occupation because um, uh, Israel does not allocate resources to people that can't and don't vote. And the Palestinians of East Jerusalem are not citizens of Israel. Um, so the infrastructures are in shambles. You will see no Israelis, very few, uh, in some parts of the old city. Anybody who says the old knows old city is, is, is lying. Nobody knows the whole old city. But those of you who think you know the old city are seeing a fragment of it. You're not seeing the hovels. You're not seeing the impoverishment. Um, today, the Jerusalem Statistical Abst uh, 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 Yearbook was published. 69% of East Jerusalem lives beneath the poverty line. That's a staggering figure. That's not my figure. That's the official figure of Israel. And finally, it is a chaotic city because you will see homes that are built one stage after another, um, uh, electrical wires uh, um, uh, strung along from one. Why? There, in 1967, there were 12,600 houses in East Jerusalem. Today, there are 60,000 houses. But we, Israel, only granted houses, uh, permits for 17,000 of them, 50 percent of East Jerusalem has been built without a permit, without licenses, without control. Why? Because we, Israel, have had the curious theory that if we do not allow the Palestinians to build legally, they will take, uh, they will lose interest in sex and childbearing and take up chess. The empirical evidence has not borne that out. So uh, what we are seeing in, in one word is a wounded, extinguished city struggling to survive. Uh, you can feel this extinguished city, but you can also fear the drive to rid oneself of occupation and remain loyal to the collective identities of the 350,000 Palestinians who live there. You said that when you enter East Jerusalem, you feel it in, in, in your palm and you can see it and that's how occupation looks like. Um, one of the reasons we wanted to have this discussion with you tonight is because annexation, uh, maybe the next step after occupation, is now um, a, potential, a, a potential policy of this new Israeli government that may, as well, that may go ahead very soon. Um, a few weeks ago, the Israeli ambassador to the UK, Mark Regev, told um, an audience in a meeting of uh, British Jews that annexation will not undermine Israeli democracy because Israel will offer citizenship to Palestinians who live in those annexed area, like in the example of East Jerusalem. Um, what can we learn then about uh, annexation if we look at the example of annex East Jerusalem maybe the differences between occupation and annexation. And what also can we learn about the prospects for those Palestinians who live in areas that will be annexed to Israel? Look, if I were younger um, and more polite, I would say that Mark Regev has an ambiguous relation with the truth. I will tell you, he is not telling the truth. Full stop the Palestinians of East Jerusalem 
are not entitled to receive Israeli citizenship. They can ask, they can apply, and we can say no. So can a Peruvian priest uh, in the Andes also ask for citizenship, and he's about, got about the same chance. Since the rule of the game is Palestinians don't ask. They don't want to be Israeli. They want to rule themselves. But when they ask, we say no. Since 1967, about 17,000 Palestinians have asked for Israeli citizenship. Out of 800, 900,000 Palestinians who have lived in the city, about 7,000 have received citizenship. It is a pittance. We never offered citizenship, we won't. The next annexation will offer less. Okay, that's quite a stark uh, prediction. Thank you for that. Um, what can we learn also from the way the international community responded to the annexation of East Jerusalem at the time and, and today about its potential response to the new annexation plans? Obviously, we're in a very different place than the one we were in 1967, 53 years ago. But is there, is there any lessons that we can draw, Israel can draw or anticipate in terms of the responses of the international community? Uh, you're asking one of the questions that we are all asking ourselves. In, in 1967, we didn't use the term annexation. You know, we, 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 and by the way, we now have the minutes of the cabinet meetings in which it was decided not to use the word annexation. We were afraid of the Goyim. Um, by the way, it's, it's fascinating. During the war, there was a debate, should Israel take the old city or not take the old city? And there was a good deal of opposition in the Israeli cabinet to take the old city. And ironically, the, those who led the opposition were the religious parties, who are today uh, the right-wing flank. They did not want to embroil Israel in a conflict with the nations of the world. Uh, the world condemned us at the time, but uh, in the heat of battle, we were able to get away with it. Today, the world is different. On the one hand, we have um, a president in the United States who, you know, short of drinking disinfectant, is you know, willing to do anything to support Israel uh, and giving us a license. Uh, we have a prime minister who is pivoting Israel in the direction of autocracy domestically and internationally. Um, on the other hand, I think the world today understands uh, and can no longer ignore what we're doing. And what we're witnessing is, uh, an un I believe, an unprecedented understanding among key European member states in the EU, that includes the UK, that includes France and Germany and others. It excludes Austria, Hungary, maybe the Czechs, um, that we are undermining the values that we share and undermining the interests not only of Israel, but of the um, uh, uh, European community and the global order. Um, I think that we may be on the brink of a firestorm um, because folks know that this is not routine. This is going to condemn the Middle East to perpetual conflict. Um, and the next weeks are going to be pivotal. Uh, there are pretty good uh, indications, but the EU and its member states have a record of barking loudly and not biting. Yes, I think we've seen in recent days a lot of condemnations and, and a lot mm. of words, but um, so far, no action perhaps that would change after um, the annexation plans become from plans to a reality. 
The and final word has not been said. <laughs> That's important to remember. Um, I would also remind our, our guests that you can submit questions in the Q&A box. We'll soon start taking your questions. Um, my next question is about how did the coronavirus crisis played out in East Jerusalem? We've seen a lot of stories in the media about how um, this virus, this crisis, showed that Jerusalem is the united capital and Palestinians, Arabs, Jews, everyone who live in Jerusalem are working together. Um, is that actually the case? I mean, did you see, I guess that's one of the tests for annex territory in terms of the democratic tests. Did the residents of East Jerusalem get to enjoy the same care and treatments that were available to, available to people living in West Jerusalem inside the Green Line? It's a great question and one that I have been following and, and actually writing about um, to work in progress because the conclusions change daily. Um, the situation in East Jerusalem is not catastrophic. Um, there is one egalitarian system in Jerusalem. It's not perfect, it's not idyllic, it has its flaws, and that's the healthcare system. And if Palestinians will be inflicted with this uh, virus, they will receive the same care as Israelis will. And that's important to bear in mind. However, East Jerusalem is apart from the West. Um, um, in this case, um, you know, for example, special rules were applied to for interactions during Ramadan, which comes to an end in a couple of days from now, we're entering um, uh, the Eid, um, and and they were reasonable regulations, the kind of things that applied in synagogues. The map of where those regulations apply are identical to the map of a permanent status Jerusalem. Jerusalem remains divided. But the most important thing is something remarkable, and we have not looked at this closely enough. None of us have looked at this closely enough. There were 3,800 mm -hmm. cases of um, contagion in West Jerusalem, most in the ultra-Orthodox areas, which are impoverished, overcrowded, and they hate the government. And two kilometers away in East Jerusalem, which is impoverished, overcrowded, and hates the government, there were 180 cases. And a good deal of that has to do with a remarkable organization of civil society in East Jerusalem. Stunning. Um, you know, the common wisdom is that a society deals with the coronavirus based on the credibility of its governance. The Palestinians of East Jerusalem do not have a prime minister. They do not have a mayor, but they replace that with their own civil society, imposing coherence and discipline. It is exhilarating to see that, and we have to understand it better. Um, you know, this isn't over, it can come back, uh, but I can only look at what has happened in East Jerusalem with a great deal of respect for the civil society that I've known and loved for the last 30 years, but is really coming into its own. Can you say a bit more about um, the fact that East Jerusalem doesn't have a mayor? Um, I mean, on paper, as um, as part as an annex part to Israel, shouldn't it be under the jurisdiction of the Jerusalem municipality? The palace in 1967, Israel annexed the land of East Jerusalem. We did not annex the population. We did not impose our citizenship. We did not offer citizenship, and they didn't want citizenship. The Palestinians of East Jerusalem are not citizens of Israel. They're not entitled to vote in the elections. Uh, they're not entitled to become uh, 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 members of Knesset or judges or mayor. They are entitled to vote for the municipality, but they don't. 
they, they, you know, there's 1.5% voter turnout because Palestinians in East Jerusalem, there are two poles to their modus operandi. One is to resist. We will not accept their occupation. The other is to adapt. We've got to live and put food on the table for our children. The Palestinians of East Jerusalem will accept any entitlement that Israel will offer as long as it does not require them to barter in their national identity. That means that they, they won't vote for mayor. Moshe Leon is not their mayor. Netanyahu is certainly not their prime minister. He probably never visited any of the Palestinian areas of East Jerusalem is in his entire life just three, two or three kilometers away from his home. Now, I have to tell you something. The mayor of Jerusalem, uh, Moshe Leon, who is not um, renowned for his favorable treatment of Palestinians in East Jerusalem, has done a superb job in dealing with the virus in East Jerusalem. He deserves credit. He did well. He opened up testing camps and centers. He, he, he took on the Israeli establishment, the Ministry of Health, uh, out of character, and he deserves praise. That doesn't turn him into the mayor of East Jerusalem. This turns him into the mayor of another city that is helping an, you know, a neighboring city. Um, you know, the Palestinians of East Jerusalem resist and uh, um, adapt. Mayor Leon has very, in a very praiseworthy way, helped them to adapt. He does not become the mayor of East Jerusalem. That's very interesting. And also, I guess this crisis shows us that Israel, like any other country, can only be as healthy and strong as its neighbors. And in, in the scenario of annexation, um, whether the current government or political actors would like it or not, the status and, and state of Palestinians living under Israeli rule would impact directly Israelis as well. Um, my last question before we take questions from, from the participants is how do, how do you think, uh, how do you believe annexation of West Bank territory, whether it's large or small, um, would impact Israelis, um, uh, Palestinians and Jews that live in East Jerusalem? We see a lot of people from the security establishment, former heads of different security agencies like the Mossad and the, Shibet, and the Shin Bet, issuing stark warnings against a, a violent uprising and, and bloodshed, do you think that that's a probable scenario? The annexation of East Jerusalem, uh, of, the, of West Bank, or parts of it, uh, will in many ways be different from the annexation of East Jerusalem. Uh, uh, we didn't bring the annexation of East Jerusalem to the Knesset. Uh, if Netanyahu wanted to annex Jerusalem, the, the West Bank, he could do it tomorrow morning by the same uh, administrative measures we used in 1967. We're not going to do that. Uh, he, he needs the theater, okay? I would be uh, greatly surprised if um, there will be any significant of numbers of Palestinians who will be annexed by an annexation. We will gerrymander in order to exclude them. We will encircle them. And in the case of Khan al Ahmar, we will commit the war crime of forceful displacement of an occupied population under occupation. That's where we're heading. Uh, but our, Netanyahu's goal is that whatever we will annex will be devoid of Palestinians. By the way, um, I think that the proposal to cut out Palestinian citizens of Israel is geared to offset the regrettable fact that we have included the 350,000 Palestinians who live with us in Jerusalem. Now, your question is the question of stability. Now, when, when 
the U.S. Embassy was moved to Jerusalem and there was recognition, uh, folks came to us and said, hey, where is the convulsive bloodshed that you promised us? Well, we didn't. We actually predicted that this would not likely lead to bloodshed. It is not usually the geopolitical moves that trigger an outbreak of violence. It's usually the threat to sacred space, particularly on Haram al-Sharif, Al-Aqsa, and the Temple Mount that does so. Having said that, um, the, the period in which we're living, the recognition of Jerusalem, the Trump plan, uh, Netanyahu's pronouncements, and the looming annexation has created a hopelessness among Palestinians, which I completely understand, uh, the likes of which I have never seen before. And hopelessness is the ultimate destabilizer. It is a destabilization that is measured in months and years and not in days and weeks, but it is there. But I, I deal with Jerusalem, that's the only thing I know, but sometimes living here is like living in Los Angeles, and you can feel the pressure on the tectonic plates moving under your feet in anticipation of the next earthquake. We are living in a state of acute disequilibrium. That disequilibrium will correct itself by a serious political process, uh, the likes of which are not in the immediate future, or by an outbreak of convulsive violence. It will happen. It may not be three months. It may be three years. It probably won't be more. It may well be in Jerusalem, but it could be in Gaza, it could be in the West Bank, it could be, but we are living in a bubble. And physicists tell us that bubbles invariably burst, we just can't tell you when. So um, as bad as things are at the moment, we are living in a fool's paradise, and this paradise will not last. Okay, with that dark warning, uh, we'll go to questions from our participants. I think I'll give you two at a time, if that's okay. Um, as I'm sure well, there will be a bit of overlap. So our first question is from Stephen. And his question is about applications for Israeli citizenships by Palestinian residents of East Jerusalem. Um, he's asking on what grounds they have been denied if there's any possibility to appeal, how would the Israeli judges respond to the situation? Um, well, that's a large, a large question with a lot of sub-questions. Um, have Israeli courts been politicized? Um, so that's the first questions about applications and the legal um, option to, to appeal. Um, the second question we have is also from someone named Steve, uh, Stephen. Um, and that's about two-state solution. Is it still an option? And are Netanyahu and Gantz prepared to go for annexation, knowing that less than 50% of Israelis support this policy? So I've got a question about the applications and then a second question about a two-state solution and public support for annexation. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, the discretion of Israel's Ministry of Interior is complete. We, we need not explain why we are rejecting, um, uh, which makes uh, judicial intervention virtually impossible. We are not required to justify why we have rejected response. Now, there's a clause in the law that says anybody between the age of 18 and 21, a Palestinian, who applies for citizenship is entitled to receive citizenship in order to accept if he, he or she is denied for due cause. There's only one problem that requires regulations, how to apply the law. The regulations have never been made and not one Palestinian young man or young woman have received it that way, which means that basically we can say 
you know, we like you, we don't like you, and move on. Um, in terms of Israeli public opinion, um, I, I'm really of two minds. I, I still think that a majority of Israelis are concerned about um, the loss of a political agreement with the Palestinians. Um, it may be lurking under the surface, but it's there. Uh, much of it depends on hearing from our friends abroad, not from our enemies, from our friends, um, and also from voices within Israel, um, how devastating annexation will be to the vital interests of Israel. Um, or I, I think that Gantz is attentive to claims like this, but has zero strength of character. He is a political invertebrate. And Netanyahu was risk averse in the past, and now he's acting as if he's Julius Caesar. Uh, I don't know how this plays itself out. Um, I don't think that this is an inevitable train wreck. I think we have uh, the battle line set uh, and weeks and months to deal with it. My major concern is that um, in order to pave the way for President Trump's re-election, he needs his base. His base drinks, drinks disinfectant and supports annexation. And that um, he will be more supportive of annexation than Netanyahu and Gantz in September when it appears if he's going, that he is going to be losing power. Look, hold on to your seats. These are gonna be an interesting few months. <laughs> Get ready for a bumpy ride. I guess our <laughs> next questions are, Exactly on that, actually. We had an anonymous question and a question from Larry Schulman, but they're quite, quite similar, so we'll put them together. Given Netanyahu had made claims of annexation before um, without carrying them out, what makes you think that, they would act, that he would actually do it this time? And is there anything that, what do you think will happen, basically, on July 1st? On July 1st, I don't think anything's going to happen. I think the, a process will begin. Look, um, I have played chess with Netanyahu for almost 30 years. I've never met the guy, and believe me, I do not feel deprived. I studied with his father, Benzion Netanyahu, uh, at Cornell. Um, uh, that was enough Netanyahu to last me a lifetime. Uh, Netanyahu, until the past few years, did not support annexation because he wanted annexation. He, in his policies, was building a de facto annexation, and he feared, I think with a good deal of um, reason, that an attempt for de jure annexation over the West Bank would jeopardize his de facto annexation. But in recent years, Netanyahu has become more imperial. He went to school with Winston Churchill. Uh, he has been become more defiant and generally risk averse. He has become less risk averse. He's also become uh, more vulnerable. Um, and he also has a once in a lifetime opportunity with a uh, president in the United States who will not only turn a blind eye, but will actively support annexation. All bets are off. I still think this is uh, stoppable, but I don't think uh, it will be stopped on its own. It will require resolute action from forces within Israel, among friends of Israel and the international community to deter Netanyahu from taking the step. Okay. Um, our next two questions, one is from an anonymous attendee, um, is about the plans of uh, Israel to cut off parts of East Jerusalem 
that are beyond the wall from its territory of jurisdiction. Uh, they name a place like Shuafat refugee camp uh, as an example. Maybe it's explained for people who don't know the area quite well. These are areas that fall under the East Jerusalem territory, but they are beyond the wall, the famous wall, separation wall. And um, so um, again, they are asking about the chatter that was a few months ago about potential plans to, for Israel to cut off uh, those parts. And the, our next question from Arthur is, do you think the nine European countries that stopped Netanyahu from demolishing Khan al Ahmar could do the same with the annexation of the Jordan Valley? <sighs> Can't you come up with easier questions? Uh, look, um, the concerns about the two Palestinian areas that are in Jerusalem as defined by Israel, and they're part of Kapar Akab on the outskirts of Ramallah and the Shuafat refugee camp, we're talking about 120,000 out of 350,000 Jerusalem residents. Uh, those fears are well-founded. Um, Netanyahu was on the brink of um, legislating, uh, excising them from Jerusalem, not turning them over to the Palestinians, God forbid. Um, uh, there had been major concerns, not entirely unfounded, about the fate of uh, these areas during uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus. Um, they have been neglected, but they're not doing bad. Um, but the Trump plan, uh, um, uh, you know, holds the banner of an undivided Jerusalem, the Jerusalem, the undivided capital of Israel that will never be redivided, which is one word in an anomaly, you'll never be able to recite it. You will never you know, you get elected for president unless you recite it seven times in a row. Trump, who invokes the undivided Jerusalem, their plan says, get rid of these. We have chewed them up and we will spit them out. The Trump plan will never happen. Never. It is not in terms of revenue. You know, it is a rather pathetic work of fiction, but it may have devastating effect. It may make it easier for a government of Israel to take these two areas, Kaparak and Shuafat and uh, Anata, and excise them for, from Jerusalem to devastating effect. That is something that we have to monitor very closely. Uh, Maya, could you remind me about the second question? Of course. Um, the second question was about the um, nine European countries that helped stopping the demolition of Khan al Ahmar. Uh, for those of you on the call who are less familiar with the case, this is a village uh, in area C of the World Bank. Um, that is, I believe, still under uh, demolition, a threat of demolition, uh, which wasn't demolished just yet, despite a lot of election promises in the past few months. Um, and the question is whether those nine European countries that made an intervention, intervention regarding Khan al Ahmar can help stop the current proposal to annex areas um, of the Jordan Valley. The answer is 100% yes. But I, I, I want to point out something. There have been a number of flagship issues, um, not mere settlements where Europe condemns and we do what the hell we want to do. Um, among those are uh, the Doomsday Settlement of E1, the Doomsday Settlement of Kibat Matos, moving the um, IDF, the Israeli Army Colleges, to the iconic site of the Mount of Oz, which we stopped, uh, and, and Khan al um, In the last three years, it hasn't been American pressure that's deterred Netanyahu from doing that. It has been a coherent engagement, usually under, you know, outside of the spotlight by European governments saying, don't, don't do that. 
And uh, Netanyahu indeed has pivoted Israel in an authoritarian direct direction domestically. And he's pivoted us in the direction of Orban Duterte, Bolsonaro, and other like, you know, humanists. Uh, but he also has indicated that he understands that uh, Duterte isn't enough. He needs Angela Merkel and he needs Macron. Um, the fact that Khan al Ahmar has not been evacuated is due to the robust, coherent engagement that we've heard from London, Paris, Berlin, and Brussels. I have no doubt about it. Um, sometimes I have to convince foreign ministers in these capitals, you're not worthless. What you do is consequential, but it's true. Now, I'm not saying that it's going to succeed this time, but there are positive indications that the key capitals in Europe are aware that these are not routine circumstances. There is a willingness to engage. Um, whether the willingness is strong enough uh, or will suffice remains to be seen. Um, the future, look, I'm going to put this very bluntly. Occupa Israel will end occupation or occupation will be the end of Israel. And these weeks and months will determine whether we will be able to end occupation. And Israel ending occupation needs the support of our friends in Europe. There are good indications. Don't listen to those who tell you you're being anti-Israel. You are doing what is necessary to allow the Zionist enterprise to survive. Good indications. Bring it on. <laughs> okay. Um, we have next two questions are from Liz and Olivia. Liz is asking, do you believe Arab states have betrayed East Jerusalemites? How do you think they will react if there is further annexation? And Olivia is asking, um, about the separation barrier and how it affects the lives of those in East Jerusalem. Um, and maybe if you can say a bit about how those who live beyond, on the other side of the barrier, the wall, uh, were affected during the COVID crisis. Uh, both great questions. Um, if we look at what happened when the U.S. recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and moved the embassy. There were indications that there were certain Sunni Arab states who were saying, oh, this sucks, but we're going to be willing to go along with it. But the Jordanians weighed in. And uh, Jordan is not the strongest of the powers in the Middle East. It's one of the most vulnerable. But on these issues, uh, their voice is pivotal and they rejected it. And at the end of the day, the United States isolated itself rather than uniting Jerusalem. Um, I, I think that the, many of the Arab states would be willing to screw the Palestinians without blinking uh, an eye, but Jerusalem won't let them. They can't abandon Alexa. And those who treat uh, Jerusalem uh, in a cavalier way, Jerusalem has a nasty trend of biting them in the ass. Um, so however much they are willing to screw the Palestinians, I don't think it's gonna happen. But I do think how forceful and coherent the opposition that we have from the Arab world, and particularly Jordan, because Jordan will set the tone, is going to be pivotal to the upcoming course of events. And again, uh, the most coherent and articulate voice that we are hearing in recent days and weeks is coming from uh, King Abdullah. It's not easy for that to happen, so it's, it's a good sign. Look, there's a distinction in the second question between the impact and what's happened during uh, COVID. 
Um, and, and this is more or less free association, so forgive me if I'm not exactly entirely coherent. Um, the areas beyond the wall that are in Jerusalem, that is Kafr Akab with about 60,000 residents and the bridge of the Shuafat refugee camp, uh, uh, Raskamis and Anita, and Anata, um, our presence is total fiction. There's no Israeli presence except for paramilitary presence. No services collapse. Um, in, and, and that led me very much to fear um, that the COVID virus would spread rampantly because there's no government to enforce, to give guidelines. That did not play out. Uh, and I think it is in large part a tribute to the civil society in East Jerusalem, which organized and imposed discipline. When Palestinian security forces entered Kafraqa with the consent of Israel, 24 hours later, we scared the shit out of ourselves and tossed them out. Um, uh, the, the, the mayor of Jerusalem provided large scale testing uh, at the exit from the Shuafat refugee camp, probably better testing that you get anywhere in the United States that didn't exist in Kafir Aqab. But this, this situation, um, the situation has, has not been disastrous. But the final point is the current borders of Jerusalem are mean, meaningless. You know, there was talk at the beginning of this that Israel would seal itself just like you know, the bastion England would seal itself from Europe or whatever. Nothing personal. It's not possible. Um, the border between East Jerusalem, the West Bank and Israel is significant, but we are in some ways one organism. It is not only the virus that doesn't obey our artificial political boundaries, people don't. Palestinians who live in Kafr Aqab and Shurfat go to Ramallah and come to central Jerusalem. We are Siamese twins and um, we need to separate but not completely. Okay, um, I would want to ask you a follow-up question on that of how you how you bring together that notion of on the one hand we are Siamese twins and we're forever together, and on the other hand the need to separate and can that ambition to separate the ambition to to secure a two-state solution is that still realistic in a post-annexation world? Um, you see many commentators and activists saying that this is a red line and after we cross it, annexation that is, um, the two-state solution is no longer a solution or a possibility and we should start working towards a different kind of, if we are to be a single state, then we should work for, for one state where everyone are equal um, and abandon the, the the dream of a two-state solution. What would you say to that? That's one question. And the other one is quite practical and you can answer it with numbers maybe. Um, it's about house, house demolitions in East Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem, as well as, uh, I would add to that, evictions. Do we have any figures about how many Palestinian homes or Palestinian families have been um, demolished and evicted in East Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. Ask me about the weather. <laughs> okay. Um, I've been working on this issue for almost 30 years. And, uh, you know, I, when I started, my work is, was more controversial than it is today. And I would be accused of being an Arab lover. It's like being a Jew lover, excuse me, an N-word lover. 
And I was like, no, 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 I'm an Israeli patriot. I have no problem saying that I love Arab civilization. My work in Jerusalem has introduced me to that. I want to share this land with Palestinians. Uh, my opposition to one state is not a principled uh, opposition. Uh, it does not negate my belief that Jews and Palestinians can have self-determination outside of the primitive um, constructs of the nation state as we know it. Having said that, look, I bullshit a lot. You know, some of the stuff I've been telling you is, you know, I, I know I stuff that I don't know a hell of a lot about, but I can get away with. I understand one thing, and that is the mechanics of occupation. If your occupation breaks down, bring it into my garage, and I will change the pistons. I'll know where to oil it. I'll know how to fix it. That's what I know, the mechanics of occupation. And I cannot see occupation ending in any way other than a border between ourselves and Palestinians. If you show me another route, I'm willing to consider it. I'm not opposed to it. And, but my friend Kamal Husseini, the president of the Bank of Palestine says, we Israelis and Palestinians have to get divorced even if we get married the following morning. We are intimate enemies, but there is no rapprochement until the divorce is completed. Show me another way. The day that that border goes up, it will begin to unravel. And, and I won't regret that. Um, I want to share this land with Palestinian compatriots. That will not happen until I am no longer their occupier, they are no longer occupied, and the only way that that can happen is by means of a primitive border. Um, demolitions and displacement. Um, and, and here my, my answers on the two of these are a bit different. Um, in 1967, there were 12,600 Palestinian homes in East Jerusalem. Today, there are more than 60,000. I just saw the new statistics come out today by the Jerusalem Institute, the Bible of those who want the statistics on Jerusalem. Um, but we've given permits for about 17,000 houses. That means 50% of the houses in East Jerusalem were built without our legally sanctioned permits. We have the curious theory that if we don't let them build legally, they will go away. Um, there has been a spike. I don't understand it. I think it is basically an attempt by the Jerusalem municipality to show who's boss. There is no pattern. There's no rhyme and reason. Uh, there are tens of thousands of outstanding demolition orders. 170 demolitions each year are not huge in the context of the numbers. They are absolutely devastating to the, Pal to the Palestinian families. Uh, um, um, affected by it. Displacement is another story entirely. Look, I've been dealing with East Jerusalem settlements since the 10th of October 1991, and I'll tell, tell you the hour of the day. It's when the settlers moved into Silwan. Um, Israel built close to 60,000 homes in East Jerusalem, we did not displace Palestinians in order to build those homes. I'm not talking about Silwan, I'm not talking about Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, there was the war crime of forcible displacement on June, June 10th, 1967, when we destroyed the Mughal quarter. It was clearly a war crime. 
But it was almost the heat of battle. We didn't do that since then. We have targeted individual Palestinian homes since then. I defended many of them, mostly unsuccessfully, sometimes successfully. Uh, what we're witnessing today is unprecedented. You know, uh, Teddy Kolek was the architect of the occupation of Jerusalem. Um, he was a great architect. He was one of the greatest mayors of the 20th century. He was an occupier and he was a genuine humanist. And a good deal of that remained and is dissipated now. Um, the occupation of East Jerusalem was a disease in remission. No longer. It is metastasizing. In two focused places, Sheikh Jarrah, Batan al Hawa, um, uh, and Um, uh, um there are hundreds of Palestinians in danger of forceful displacement in ways that we have not witnessed since 1967. Um, the same as with Khan al Ahmar, the same as with Susia. Um, when we target a Palestinian, I'm often hear the term ethnic cleansing. Palestinian population was 70,000 in 1967. It's 350,000 today. I'm sorry, that's not ethnic cleansing. But the populations in Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan are targeted for government-backed forceful displacement under occupation. That is ethnic cleansing. We are on the cusp of it. It is not about to happen. It is happening. And that is the, one of the things that we need to seriously engage on. This is huge. Um, we only have a few more minutes and there's so many fantastic questions. So with your permission, perhaps we'll spill over five minutes after eight, if that's okay. They're just as much as you want. <laughs> Um, so I live that, until the end of occupation. Okay, <laughs> that might be long. You may need to <laughs> get a little something to drink. Um, so we have a question from Avraham um, asking if you can speak a bit about last month um, Israeli raid on Silwan's COVID testing clinics due to PA provision of testing kits there. And also if you can talk a bit about what's going on in Silwan now, especially after the um, Ambassadors Friedman in famous sledgehammer incident, which those of you here who don't know it, I highly recommend Googling it and seeing the pictures <laughs> of um, the American ambassador using the sledgehammer to break through a um, cardboard box, I think they were. And the last question for you is about occupation more generally. Um, they say it's an, it's an anonymous question saying occupation was ended in Gaza and now Iranian rockets are, are fired from there at Tel Aviv. If occupation of the West Bank were to end, what makes you think the outcome would be different? Both great questions. Thank you. Um, it's really interesting. Um, there is a village immediately adjacent to Jerusalem, which is Area B. Area B is under civilian control of the Palestinian Authority, but military control of Israel. And Israel consented to allow Palestinian security forces to come into Azaria and enforce the rules of distancing, social distancing, etc because of the coronavirus. We did precisely the opposite in East Jerusalem. We have been trying to crush any Palestinian political activity more radical than a scout meeting, even before the corona crisis. Uh, we've broken up um, football matches between eight-year-old kids you know, accusing them of being affiliated with the Palestinian Authority. And I'm not talking about the distant future, I'm talking about four months ago. 
Uh, and we did the same in uh, Sowan, and we did the same after having allowed Palestinian security forces to enter, quote unquote, Israeli Kafir Aqab, we threw them out. And the indication is Israel is willing to cooperate with the Palestinians in order to combat this virus as long as it does not undermine Israel's claim to a fictitious, mythical, um, um, uh, united Jerusalem that exists only in the imagination of right-wing ideologues, um, even if it will cost lives, even if it will cost lives. That, that by the way, in the 1990s, the Israeli police in Shin Bet would work with Jabil Rajub in imposing order in East Jerusalem and on the Temple Mount. And that was under Netanyahu. But Netanyahu of the 1990s is not Netanyahu of the, of the 220s. And, you know, you know, look, nobody's perfect. Um, remind me of the second question quickly. The second question was, we left Gaza, we got rockets. What reason do you have to believe it would be any different if we end the occupation of the West Bank? Okay, uh, I have a couple of answers for that. Take it to the generals. Look, you know, I'm a reserve major in the Israeli army, but I am no great military expert. Um, but if you look at the commanders for Israeli security, 90% of the Israeli uh, military establishment, IDF, Mossad, Shin Bet say that occupation is a greater threat to Israel's existence uh, uh, than any potential external threat coming from the outside. That's one answer. Um, the other answer is uh, you're looking at it the wrong way. Um, Israel has made two peace agreements, one with Egypt and one with Jordan. Uh, the one with Egypt survived a Muslim Brotherhood government. They maintained the peace agreement with Israel. That's um, fucking amazing because we agreed. We withdrew unilaterally from Lebanon without an agreement. And look at what's happened. We withdrew unilaterally from Gaza. We could have done it in a way that was coordinated with the Palestinian Authority, with Abu Mazen. We didn't do that. Um, so my conclusion is agreements work, unilateralism doesn't. Finally, nobody will tell me that the open air prison of Gaza is not occupied. And that's not, you know, we decide whether they can drink Coca-Cola I had a conversation a few years back with an American general, White Door, wonderful guy, who tried to get the opening of a Coca-Cola plant opened in Gaza, and he couldn't because Israel claimed that there were things that go into Coca-Cola that could be used to make weapons. He said, I will put officers next to those materials. We wouldn't accept. Um, and that's not a theoretical question. That's where we're heading. If the Trump plan is implemented, there won't be a Palestinian state. There will only be an archipelago of Palestinian Bantustans. No airspace, no tele telecommunication space, no international border, no contiguity, and we'll call it a state. Give me a break. Okay, I think that's a good point to to finish this this call. I'm sure that if this was 
an event in the real offline world with a room full of all these people that joined us tonight from their computers. There would be a lot of breaks for, for laughs and uh, applause. I think that you're one of the only ones that managed to get some humor and um, jokes into this quite dark <laughs> <laughs> and serious issue. Um, I think your, your last point about the examples of Jordan and Egypt um, and Lebanon that this week we mark, or, or this month, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we mark 20 years to do with war from Lebanon. And there's a lot of conversations started coming out for people who were soldiers in, in that, and served in that war and talked about the complete waste of, of time and, and the meaningless um, death that occurred um, in, in that war. And I, I hope that your work and the work of your colleagues and other partners of, of Yachad and other NGOs and activists would carry on working so this conflict won't have any more uh, useless death in it as well. Um, and I know that's what we in Yachad do day in, day out, uh, trying to support the work you are doing in the region because we completely agree that the security and safety and uh, the right to, to live a safe life is, uh, has to be the reality of, of everyone who lives in the region, Israelis and Palestinians. Um, so I thank you again. Um, I recommend to all of our attendees, if you don't already, follow Danny on Twitter. Um, and I hope you have a lovely evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.